Hi, welcome to the Enterprise 2.0 Workbench, episode 11. My name is John Brunswick, and today we're going to create a self-service portal to allow end users to log in and see service requests, along with recommended content to resolve their service request. We're going to do this using Web Center Portal. We're going to make this very easy because we're going to be using some middleware to then make access to those backend systems very straightforward. We're going to use Oracle Service Bus to aggregate and transform information from Siebel CRM and Web Center content to then provide, again, a very simplified interface for the portal to interact with. We're going to take a look at the system from a couple aspects. One, we're going to log in as an end user, take a look at our different support requests and see what content gets suggested back to us. Then we're going to take a look from a Siebel standpoint and from a Web Center content contributor standpoint to see what those experiences are like. We're going to do a deep dive then on the service bus and what we did there to work with these systems. The beauty of this is not only did our Web Center portal take roughly 10 minutes to build on top of this interface, but in addition to that, if we ever need to upgrade Siebel or Web Center content or change one of those systems, it's very, very easy to do without disrupting that end user experience. So let's start, log in, and take a look at our service requests. So we've arrived at our sample portal, and we're going to go ahead and log in as our test account. And after we enter the portal, we're going to hop into the customer support area. What we'll notice is that on the left-hand side, we see our support requests. And on the right-hand side, we see some related help documents. If we look at the attributes of the support request, we have traditional things like the support request number and product. And what we're doing here behind the scenes is we're actually using the service bus not only to simplify all of the different fields that are being seen here, but to actually make the correlation to what documents help to actually support the requests. So if we look on the right hand side, we see troubleshooting with interest uh, checking maximizer and a quick start guide for the checking maximizer. And if we look at our support request, it is for in fact the checking maximizer. If we go ahead and open one of these links in a new window, We'll notice at the top of the screen, if you're familiar with the content server, this is actually being served up by the content server. Let's take a look at our other support request. We'll see that as we flip over to the second support request, it's about the Excel cache management solution. And on the right hand side this time, we actually see the Excel diagnostic tips document. So this is an example of, again, something that took about 10 minutes to put together here, but provides a very efficient interface for a customer to come in and do some self-service with. Let's log out of our portal, and let's take a look behind the scenes from kind of an administrative standpoint. If we hop over into a Siebel instance that we have, what we'll be able to see, we were working inside a particular account. And in a moment here, when Siebel loads up, we'll hop into our accounts. And the support requests that we we're dealing with were from the Austin Consulting Group. And if we go into the Austin Consulting Group record here, we can actually just scroll through here. I'm in as an administrator, so we're seeing quite a bit of information. It would normally be a, a lot faster. But we can see here, these are the two different issues that we were looking at. And if we drill into the first one, we can actually see all the details, the issues with the billing component for the interest checking maximizer all the details here that were actually reflected in our web interface. Now let's leave Siebel for a moment and let's hop over to our content server. So if we go ahead and browse the libraries available within the content server, we can see that there's an area here called support documents. And we can see here the interest checking maximizer quick start guide, the troubleshooting interest checking maximizer document, everything that somebody would need to do to maintain the knowledge base that would get correlated back to the products can be done through this interface. It can also be done by dragging and dropping with the desktop integration suite. We're making the correlation actually on the basis of keywords.
And so we see here in the Interest Checking Maximizer Quick Start Guide, if we scroll down, we should be able to, oh, just at the top here, we see the keywords Interest Checking Maximizer. So again, we were able to make that correlation very simply on the basis of filling in the keywords. And in an instance where we would want to have people drag and drop and have some presets, when somebody were to drag and drop into a folder here like the Excel folder, what we've actually done is, actually let me, I'll just try the uh, interest checking maximizer folder. Go back here. What we've actually done is we've gone ahead and set up the folder initially to right outside uh, any documents they're dragging and dropped into it to have the keywords automatically assigned. So what happens is if somebody drags and drops into a folder, uploads into a folder, automatically it's going to pick up those keywords and be associated. And that allows us again when we're in the portal interface to very easily go ahead and have that holistic experience that pulls together both the Siebel information and the information from Web Center content. Let's take a look behind the scenes at what we did with the service bus to help make this very easy from the portal standpoint. So we're inside of Eclipse here and we're able to very easily interact with the service bus because we're using Oracle's Enterprise Pack for Eclipse. On the left hand side in the navigator, we'll just give a quick rundown of the different items that we're using here in our project. Let me see if I can't give us a little bit more room. The main service, actually the only service that we want people to externally call into is this aggregate support proxy. And this is what goes ahead and aggregates all the information between Siebel and Web Center content and does all the transformations. So gives a very simple interface in and a very nice format on the way out. Now this proxy is based on a WSDL. And you can see here within our aggregate support project, we have a couple areas, WSDLs being one of them. Let's just start there for a moment. If we go ahead and look, we have the aggregate support service WSDL here. And this is the WSDL that we're actually calling from the portal. So when we go ahead and call the get aggregate support by customer operation, all that we have to do is pass in an account ID, which is a string. And the account ID that we passed in was actually a Siebel account ID. If we go back to the main view for our WSDL, we can see here that as far as an output, we get something called aggregate support. And if I drill in, we can see that our aggregate support response includes what we were able to see about the ticket inside of our portal interface. So things like the product, things like a summary, but you'll notice here some of the names are a little bit different. So we change the labels inside of our portal interface. If I go a level further, we can see that for every aggregate support item, we actually can have one or more support documents. And those documents have things like an ID, name, description, and a file URL. Again, these fields are a little bit different than what directly comes from Content Server. And that's part of the beauty of the service bus. We actually get to create a layer that is really the kind of generic, the canonical format that we would want to use for something like this. We don't have to keep explicitly what our backend systems have. So let's go back to our support proxy for a moment. And the nice part when we look at this uh, proxy, and a proxy, that's a term that's used for things that either are going to be called uh, from the bus or used internally within the bus. We use this proxy to create a request that goes through essentially two different phases. One, the first phase, we want to get all of the support tickets from Siebel. And we're able to do that using what's called a service callout, where we call out to what's called a business service that we've defined. And the way we're able to do that in our service callout, each one of these nodes here in the visual editor, if we select it, we can see the details of the particular node. So we could see here that the service callout calls one of our proxies that's going to invoke the get aggregate support by customer and we're going to go ahead and put together a variable called support 
list request, which is the XML structure for our request. And we're going to capture the response in support list response. And if we go to the assign node that resides within the service callout, and we click on it, this particular syntax here for this expression takes that account ID that we talked about, and it takes the text from it and places it into the service call uh, that we're going to end up making against Siebel. So this particular service call, again, it's a proxy that we're using within the service bus here. And let's drill down and take a look at it. We've called it service request proxy. And again, that's to keep things somewhat generic, because if we ever upgraded, changed, or moved things around within this particular system, it wouldn't have an impact on how we'd have to deal with the names and the objects. So what's interesting here, we're essentially consuming a, a sub proxy, if you will. And within it follows a very similar pattern but the there's one major difference here. The difference is that the request that we place into Siebel is much more complex than just the single parameter that we're passing into our main proxy. So if we take a look at the replace node here, and we take a look at the expression that we're using, we're actually using something called xQuery here to provide a transformation between the way that we view the support request and the way that Siebel needs to have the request made. And what we're doing is we're, we're mapping our variable against the, again, the interface that Siebel ultimately needs. So this xQuery here, aggregate to support request transformation, if we go into our transforms folder and open it up, we're able to see here, at first it looks like a very simple transformation. It's a little bit more complicated than what meets the eye. But we're able to see here that, again, we have a very simple interface that just takes an account ID. And we can see that we map it to, this is actually the service from the, uh, the structure for the service from Siebel. We, can, we map it to a search spec. And so if we go to our target expression here, we do something where we actually, instead of just passing the value by itself, we do a little bit of concatenation and place it in a format that Siebel is going to require. In addition to that, there are a couple different items here where we've set constants. So for instance, something like page size. And if we scroll down the list, things like view mode and LOV language mode we're setting to constants. If we don't do this, Siebel won't accept our request. So these are some defaults that are required by Siebel. But again, for our purposes, all we care about is the account ID. One other thing to note here, and it's best seen in the source, if I go to the source of the transformation, there are a whole bunch of fields here that we're passing into Siebel that don't have any value or constant associated with them. We have to do that, not only um, because some of these, again, something like a LOV language mode is required, and there we are passing a constant, but in this case, if we don't pass them in with the request, they don't come back with the response. So let's, let's go back to our, as I was calling it, a sub-proxy, essentially. And we can see that we uh, end up doing a couple things. We log, which is very straightforward. We can actually take a variable and just make sure that it shows up in the WebLogic server console. So we get a sense of what's going on behind the scenes as we go through all of this. And as we get the response, we get a chance to massage the response. So here we can see that we're doing a couple things with um, some replacements and manipulations of the reply that comes back from Siebel. And we can see that just as we did a transformation with our request, we're doing a transformation on the response here. So support response to aggregate transformation. And if we load that up, we can see that this is a little bit more visually complex than what we had before because, again, we're only interested in certain values. And so what we've done here is we've taken the Siebel response with all of the different attributes, and we've handpicked the ones that we want to bring over to our model that we're working with. So again, our canonical model to think about these service requests.
For some of them, we're just pulling the value directly over, and we can see that here in this general expression area. For others, what we're actually doing is, again, we're doing some manipulation. We're, pr we're using some functions to actually change the way in which the data is ultimately stored. So in this case, on the Siebel side, they have a date time setting for created. In our model, we're just simply using a string. This is a very basic model for demonstration purposes. So let's go back to our main proxy, and let's assume for a moment that this service callout worked. We'll notice that we then start to go into a new area where before we enter that area, we create a variable that's ultimately going to end up holding our total overall response in the format that we want. And we're calling this aggregate support list. And after we set that up, we go into a for each. So if you remember, our first service callout could get one, it could get zero or many particular service requests. And what we want to do then is for each one of those, we want to loop through. And so we're taking the support list response that was a variable that we created from our service callout. And we're going ahead and um, this is something that took me a bit of Googling, but we're using things like XPath and other ways to interpret the, the data that we're working with. And based on that, we're able to, to grab the particular entities and in this case, we're assigning those to something that we're calling support record. So in the XML that came back from our service request, there was an aggregate support node for each service request. And we're going to go ahead and assign that to support record. The index variable, the count variable, those are just things to help us, um, at least in this case, to debug. And we'll see in a moment when we actually run our flow, we'll see how they kind of come into play just to help us to make sure that we're looping through and addressing each one of the entities within the loop. So before we make our call out to Web Center content for each one of the service tickets, we do something here to just visually simplify the way in which we go through the process. For each of the support records, we want to grab the product name. So if we remember from our example, the interest checking maximizer and the Excel issue, what we're doing here, we're grabbing those product names and now we're going to use those product names in our second service callout. So this service callout here again is calling a proxy that is internal just for our usage and it's invoking get support documents. We're going to send in a request that is a document list request and we're going to get a response predictively called document list response. If we go to the assign, it's very similar to before where what we're doing is we're actually based on the particular operation that we're going to call on our web service. We're going ahead and setting some information. In this case, we're going to pass along a search term and the search term actually is the product name. Now, this particular proxy service is the support documents proxy, again named in such a way to give us a little bit of abstraction. If I go into the support document proxy and go into the message flow, in this case, it's very straightforward. Because the format is so simple, we're not having to do any transformations with the request or the response. And if we go ahead and look at this particular service call, we're actually doing what's called using the inbound operation for outbound. So we're going to keep the formatting. Um, uh, we don't, again, don't have to do any adjustments with the formatting. Let's go back to our overall proxy view. And after we complete that call, if we get a response from it, what we want to do then is take all of that information that we potentially got about our documents and place it alongside the record, the service request record that it belongs with. And we're doing that with a transformation cure called support record with doc to aggregate trans. And if we open that up, we can see here that for the first time, we're taking information from both the service request and the document, and we're aggregating it into our aggregate support object here. On the left-hand side, this aggregate support uh, type is bound back to the service, um, the support record. And down below, the response here for the related documents is based on a variable that we're assigning the response from our document um, call over to Web Center content. 
And so, again, we're mapping all of that directly into a single object here where aggregate support can have zero or more documents associated with it. Let's go back again to our final view. And our last item here is insert, where what we're going to do is every time we go through and get a support request and the associated documents, we want to take that and put it in a larger grouping of all of the support requests um, for that given user. Now the final stage, once we've completed all of those different areas within the flow, what we're going to do is we're actually going to go ahead and the, the body of the XML document that we're going to return, we're going to go ahead and replace it with that aggregate support list. And again, that is the total of everything that we've done with regard to the requests and the transformations. The only thing that we didn't touch on going through uh, things here really are the business services. Business services are set up within the service bus such that they represent really enterprise services that are outside of the bus. So what we did here is the support request biz.biz. That's actually the Siebel web service. We registered the Siebel WSDL to get us the operations for Siebel. And the support documents bizbiz biz, actually goes against a custom service that we built on top of Web Center content. So now, if we have our proxy selected, we can right-click it and select Run As, Run on Server, and we get a very nice interface here. I'm just going to maximize this. We get a very nice testing interface here where it shows us the available operations, and it lets us actually populate the response that we want to send into the system. And we can see here that we're calling the Get Aggregate Support by Customer Operation, and we're allowed to pass in an account ID. So I know just from working with the Siebel system here that the account that I want to use for testing is 1-AWP. After I fill this out, I can go and hit Execute, and the system has gone through and processed our request. So if I, let me just get this uh, maximized for us. There we go. If I take a look here, we can see our request document. So we have a SOAP envelope, the header, and then in the body, we have the XML that we just put together in the request. And as I scroll down, we can see this very nice response document. And in the response document, this is exactly what we were seeing within our self-service portal. Each um, node within Get Aggregate Support by Customer Response gives us the ID, product, abstract, and all of the related documents for that given support request. And this is happening behind the scenes on the basis of the given product name. Pulls it all together. What's really nice about the service bus is based on the diagram that we were shown with our service, we have a whole um, series of nodes here that we can navigate to look through call by call and any time that we went through and manipulated or transformed information, we can see the changes. And so if we go in here, we can see that when we invoke the support request proxy, we can see the body that we sent in with the request, and we can see the body that came back with the response. And we can see the same for every time that we called out to the content system. So we can see here that underneath the covers, it automatically called out interest checking maximizer. And we can see the response here of the XML that we were getting from the content system. If we scroll down a little bit further, we can start to see some more of the raw things that happened before we were really getting the transformation. So earlier I mentioned, by the way, that some of those things that give us um, counts and index values as we loop through, they're very helpful later for making sure that the XML maps appropriately back to this. We in fact did get two responses to support um, records and we can see here that's correct. Now as we look through we can see the um, raw responses that we got from some of the systems. Let me open a couple of these up.
and again we could um, you know we could log more things into this interface etc to get a better idea of how everything merges together but fundamentally that that is how the system works now one of the nice things for any one of these different calls we could open up some other tools to take a quick look and kind of do a sanity check about what occurred throughout the process um, if I go ahead and actually open up the console for instance there was a node where we went ahead and did some logging when we called out to Siebel's services and we can see here that we actually logged our raw request out to Siebel and we could have done the same with the response one of the things that I used extensively when going through and testing was the SOAP UI tool. If you haven't used SOAP UI before, it's a terrific tool. And what it allows us to do is actually, again, see some of these nice um, raw formatting for if we're calling directly against the services. And so just some different ways to look at the system here as we're calling through. The final part that we'll take a real quick look at is inside of JDeveloper. If we take a look at our project, very uh, very simple straightforward portal project nothing out of the ordinary let me just uh, go to our service request page the big thing here is that when we were working with the service bus we we're able to very easily leverage its services and drag and drop into our interface because within our um, IDE connections we can actually register our bus and so everything that we were looking at in the interface within the bus we're able to see here and we were simply able to locate our support proxy go ahead create a data control from it based on that that actually gave us this data control within JDeveloper and we were able to just as we would any other page drag and drop it into the environment and set up the interface that called back into our service and that's what we did here uh, the the nice part again about doing all the hard work inside of the service bus at the end of the day the portal part was very trivial to put together and again it gives us something that we know isn't going to be brittle and gives us a real nice ability to get fine-grained kind of tracing and understanding of what's going on with our various service calls etc